and welcome to Safest Family on the Block, where knowledge is power. I'm your host, Jason, and joining me today is Tom Callis. Now, Tom has been a martial artist for a really long time. To put that in perspective, I've been training for 37 years, and he's been doing it long enough that he is one of my heroes and one of my mentors in the art. We'll leave it to him whether or not he wants to tell us exactly how long that is. But welcome, Tom. Thank you for having me, Jason. It's an honor to be on your show. <laughs> I don't know about that, but thank you very much for being here. Now, Tom, I hinted at it, but you've been a martial artist for a really, really long time. And could you start by telling our audience a little bit about your martial arts journey, how you got into it, what you've learned, why you've remained so passionate about it for so long? Well, I, like many people, my first exposure to martial arts was Bruce Lee in, uh, in the uh, Green Hornet. You know, I, was, I think it was about 1964. Uh, I took my first lesson in 1969. I walked into the local military gym and there were some guys doing judo. They didn't teach kids, but I hung out long enough that they would invite me on and teach me break falls and how to throw the big guys and, and it, that kind of... Uh, cultivated my interest and uh, I soon found some friends to practice with out of uh, Bruce Tegner books for anybody who grew up in my era. Bruce Tegner was the, I don't know, what's a comparable author, the Dr. Seuss, you know, of everybody knew who Bruce Tegner was. And uh, then I joined a school in 71 and uh, up until last year, uh, due to a spiral fracture of my femur just a couple years before I've had to slow down my training but otherwise it's been about 50, 50 years and uh, I think that most people my age and older who've done martial arts have experienced the same kind of physical disabilities or a, see a, a decline in their mm -hmm. skill level it's just they didn't have Facebook to complain about it on <laughs> So uh, we well, hear I think a lot of the guys. Yeah, I think a lot of the traditional arts also they developed at a time that we didn't really live to our 60s and 70s, and so there were things that in the training itself that are harder on the joints than the current human lifespan is ready for. Well, and also we didn't we didn't have as good a conduit of information mm -hmm. than like anybody watching this now has access to smart people talking about smart things that they're interested in and you can find no shortage of it. And uh, so we didn't know how to train. And so I, you know, if, if the diet required 30 grams of protein, I like a typical kid thought, Oh, 60 must be twice as good. Same thing with uh, physical training, you know, more was better and it isn't. Uh, but we just didn't, we weren't quite sophisticated enough at the time uh, to disseminate that information to all the young people who were training. So mm. I think we did a lot of things collectively that make it harder to be old, you know? Mm. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm looking forward to discovering that firsthand. <laughs> well, anybody watching this is older than me is mm. thinking, oh, you're just a young whip whippersnapper, but <laughs> martial arts has been really good to me. And what it, mm -hmm. what it taught me, what it did was it gave me exposure to people who embraced practices that it required consistency and self-discipline and introspection and uh, single-mindedness, you know, that you, when you practice martial arts and you're really involved, especially if you're engaged with someone else, not a lot of time to worry about other things. You know, you have to be present focused and, mm -hmm being able to take those ideas and apply it to academics, to family life, to hobbies, to whatever you're interested in, that's the real benefit of the martial arts, not the, mm. the practice on the mat, but when you can take what you practice on the mat mm. and apply it in your life to other things in a formula that works, you know, that mm. allows you to accept uh, that the respect is required from both ends, that it takes uh, collaboration and cooperation and that you are going to fail a lot and that that's just part of the practice and all these ideas that we can apply to anything, be it writing books or uh, running a marathon or very similarly, raising children, right? <laughs> it can be a marathon. 
Oh, yes. And that actually brings us up to when I, you and I became part of each other's orbits, you had this theme about taking martial arts out of the dojo into the world. You had a tagline on one of your websites about how eating well is self-defense. And I wanted maybe to have our listeners get a chance to experience your thoughts on that, especially as it comes in, especially as it involves parenting about self-defense isn't kicking and punching. In fact, I think most experienced martial arts will agree that if you're kicking and punching, you've probably made some mistakes earlier than that that were best avoided. But what are some of those self-defense aspects beyond the mat that parents especially might want to think about and consider? Well, you know, uh, I think the media plays, has played a huge role, uh, not an evil one, but a huge role in the, how we look at self-defense. You know, mm-hmm. I just the other day, I saw a martial arts advertisement for a school that had a pretend scenario where the girl steps away from the bar and the guy follows her and then he, she disables him, you know, and we think about Mm self-defense from that perspective. And I think parenting too, uh, as it's been modeled in many television shows and movies, it affects how we think about parenting. And so I don't know if anybody thinks about Jim Cleaver anymore, if if that's ancient history, but uh, so it occurred to me after much practice and in, in, and immersion in, well, what is self-defense? What do I have to protect myself from? Is it the bad guy in the alley or whatever? You just come to the natural conclusion, especially if you, like I did, I was on my computer one day and on MSN came across an article about the top 10 killers of men, women, and children in the world. So I went through the list, I read the article, and we weren't addressing a single one of those on our mats. The things that actually kill, cause suffering, pain, dismemberment, death, whatever. So I started to embrace those ideas. And they included, uh, a lot of them were, uh, the top 10 killers were food related, uh, diabetes, you know, type two and, and uh, lifestyle related. Mm-hmm. And I started to, to investigate how to introduce my young and impressionable students and my old and impressionable students uh, to ideas that enlarged what self-defense is. Mm -hmm. And that uh, led us to talk about attitude and uh, community Mm -hmm. engagement and what were you putting in your mouth and where did that food come from and how was, how did it get there? And it's just uh, a continuation of, you know, everything's kind of connected, you know, you just look Mm. here, then you look beyond. And so I think parenting is a lot like that too, because, Mm -hmm. you know, you want, you're trying to prepare your, your, your children for Mm -hmm. a life that's sane and smart. And it doesn't always include just looking good or surviving a conflict. Sometimes it's about what you do when you wake up in the morning and who you're exposing yourself to in ideology or, or philosophy, and then how you care for others and how you engage and connect. And I don't think it's a mystery to anybody watching. It's just in the martial arts community, it wasn't always connected. We viewed self-defense, a very small portion of the pie of what is self-defense. And that was hand-to-hand combat. Yeah. Well, I haven't had any hand-to-hand combat <laughs> other than, you know, that I asked for. And, uh, but I've been faced with many, many things, as anybody watching this has, that have uh, made me feel uncomfortable or sad or ineffective or uh, where I felt like I didn't, I wasn't empowered enough to do this or I was afraid. So these being able to take these self-defense ideas and expand them into things that really increase the quality of life has been the, the, the core of my work for the last uh, 20, 25 years in the international martial arts community. It does put me in mind that I ran cross country starting in grade school and I would used to joke that my first self-defense art was running. <laughs> and, and now in my late forties, Because it's not going to be a mugger that gets me. I'm a middle-class, middle-aged dude lives in the suburbs. It's going to be a heart attack. So guess what? My first self-defense is running every day, getting that cardio up. 
what goes around comes around. Yeah. Um, and you're an excellent runner, by the way. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that's how it is. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we, you take your child to a self-defense course. Mm -hmm. well, what, what are they going to learn? You know, how to block a punch and, mm -hmm. or a counter. And I, those are aspects of self-defense like evasive driving, you know, is an aspect of it, uh, or how to, you know, when you start skidding, how to turn the wheel and mm -hmm. apply the brake and so on. But there's so many different aspects to it. And so that's kind of what uh, my work has been about. And that's what we're talking about today is looking at self-defense from a different perspective. And in, in this case, every single adult a parent, for the most part, can be a self-defense instructor to a young person because the things that are really gonna hurt them are well within their scope of knowledge, mm -hmm. you know, uh, serving food at breakfast and, you know, mm -hmm. and having books and art around the home that uh, teach lessons that kids can remember, you know, because mm -hmm. there's a, that impressionable period when whatever they ingest sticks with them for a long time. Mm -hmm. From 14 on, not so much. Nothing stays, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. 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 My youngest is 10, so he still thinks I'm Superman. No. But I that's that's going to change. My oldest, of course, has gotten over the Superman era for, for <laughs> quite some time. Uh, it's interesting that you mentioned self-defense as a parent, about being a parent being a self-defense instructor, that I think that a lot of us who trained in martial arts or had otherwise kind of more action-oriented interests and hobbies before we were parents, we feel that pressure that to be a protector of our kids. And it sounds like one of the things that you're saying is that one of the best things we can do to protect our kids is to you know, lead by example, live those things, demonstrate those skills that they can use to keep themselves safe outside of you know, physical hand-to-hand -hand combat, which you know, we we're lucky enough to live in North America and it's not really a part of most of our lives, but those daily habits are things that can make a huge difference in our life, in our lifespan and the quality of our life every day for our entire lives. Well, the thing about learning martial arts is it's experiential. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't gather together and talk about it or mm -hmm. simply just watch films of other people doing mm -hmm. it. And, uh, you don't sit on the mat and watch somebody else perform. You get to get up and engage it. And of course, that re that requires a certain amount of bravery because you're going to make a lot of mistakes. It takes a while to figure out where to hold the hand even, you know, and how to make the fingers safe. And But eventually you get it. And the same thing with things that you want your children to value, creating experiences for them rather than just lectures. And I have to be the first to say, because I've been thinking about it lately, both of my parents are gone. And uh, I was thinking back about the things that they tried to teach me and how I'm sure they tried to introduce me to life changing ideas uh, purposely to try to get me to remember something or learn some lesson. I don't know if I remember any of those. I remember simple things. My dad cracking the uh, egg that he made in the morning and or how he cut up a cantaloupe for breakfast mm -hmm. or you know things that I don't think that they were aware that I was absorbing but I remember those things and I have no recollection of anything that they tried to teach me where they took me to civil rights monument or you know who knows mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I'm sure they did it because parents mm -hmm. do those things but are the kids paying attention you know who knows but creating experiences for kids is how I went about teaching black belts to be better teachers as we mm -hmm. just created experiences that instead of me telling you what I wanted you to know, you got to explore it through action. And I think one of the things that anybody who's raising children can embrace is uh, the question, who have you helped? Who or what have you helped today? Mm. Because uh, that question leads to us to think about, well, nobody, or, oh, I help grandma, or I help the neighbor, or, but that idea that uh, it requires some action. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite teachers, now gone, was a martial arts teacher named Jun Ri. He was a friend of Bruce Lee, took, knew Muhammad Ali, taught in the, the uh, congressional gym to senators and congressmen for like 35 years, volunteered, you know, he was... Uh, quite the, 
the philosopher and uh, was one, uh, one of the original uh, Bush's uh, thousand points of light. But he had a saying, he said, if a picture's worth a thousand words, then an action is worth a thousand pictures. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that taking action and, and breaking down the things that you want them to experience into some sort of practice, a daily practice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because uh, diet, fitness, attitude, all of those things are not something you just, you don't just get fit and stay fit. It requires action and, and mm -hmm. consistent, not too much, not too little. And the same thing with getting kids to a place where they're experientially uh, embracing things that parents would like to see them embrace, like compassion for others, empathy, and uh, involvement, and the lack of fear to step in and say, I can help, you know, things that, that make, you know, I live in a community that's kind of idyllic, you know, I mean, it's isolated and protected and, uh, there's no, there's no commerce around and, and it's uh, populated mostly by young families. And I'm riding my bike down the street and kids are waving at me and leaving their bikes on the, the you know, and it's like a throwback to something, but in, in given the right environment and with a little coaching, you know, kids can be an active and involved, friendly part of a community. And, but that, you know, that r reminds me that, you know, how many times do I see kids waving? And not if, mm. if I were raising kids again, I'd teach them how to connect with others. And, mm. and I used to take my daughter around. Uh, we lived in Placerville, California. And on Saturday mornings, I'd take her tricycle down and she begged me to go to the candy store. And I'd say, yes, you can have one piece of candy. You can buy 10 others and share them. So mm. we'd get the candy. She'd have her piece. We'd walk down the street, go into the store. She'd say... <laughs> And I'd say for her, she's practicing sharing. Mm. And uh, so, of course, she was met. She was cute. She was in her princess costume. And mm -hmm. So she was met with a lot of positive feedback. But even today, uh, those lessons, uh, she's become an activist. She goes to Berkeley. You know, I think that I couldn't, I don't know any other way to have had her actively engaged if I hadn't taken her out and given her these experiences. So... That's one of my self-defense mm -hmm. tips is, you know, talk, talk, ask yourself the question, who has my child helped? What have they helped today? And it could be anything from protecting uh, pollinator areas, you know, having a sign put out, you know, this is no, no sprays here. It could be a cleanup of the local creek, you know, some portion of it. It could be doing something nice for someone uh, we just had somebody pass away, so we've been bringing food to the spouse, you know, spouse. Kids can get involved in this, and it's something you can do every day in just incremental fashions, be it writing a note or actually getting out of the house and helping somebody. That uh, feels very much like the flip side of Mr. Rogers' old advice, which is, and right now, for, for viewers who are watching this lately, we're recording this in the middle of the COVID pandemic and the civil unrest throughout America about Mr. Rogers would say, you know, when things are scary, look for the helpers. Parents point out the helpers to your kids. And you're saying that, you know, we should look for the helpers and we should find ways that we can become our helpers. Yeah, well, you know, you know what? Part of my work in the martial arts community was mm -hmm. seeing where we were and then thinking about well, what is the potential of where we could be? And what was the difference between where we are and where we'd like to be? Mm -hmm. A lot of times that was education based, you know, we're not going to teach things. You can't teach something you don't know. Uh, we're not going to teach kids about the dangers of food and diabetes and, and about the disease if I don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. So filling that gap was mm -hmm. part of the work. And I think the same thing goes for parents. You know, there's a, you have to fill the gap of, what do you want them to, what is the potential of a young person? And what do I have to know? You know, who do I have to engage with to give them experiences? But when we were trying to train instructors how to take on whole new ideas, uh, it became uh, evident that we, it was best approached through small daily efforts. Like for example, one of the requirements of uh, our black belt test, which lasted a year was the, uh, documentation of a thousand acts of kindness. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, by the way, a lot of instructors would say, I don't, I'm not recording my kindness. I, I'm not doing that because it's, I, I'm not like going to shout out, Hey, I'm kind. Look here, look how many kindness things I've done. And I, and I understood that, but my response to them would be, you know, there are things you do as an instructor that for others that you would never do for yourself. And the wisdom of a thousand acts of kindness was it was only three a day for a year. Mm. A thousand is overwhelming, three I can handle. And likewise, with anything that you're trying to introduce your children to or uh, ma uh, uh, a path of thinking or a, an a adoption of, of an ideology, it, doesn't, it may seem overwhelming to think you're going to take them from here to there. Just focus on what you do a little bit every day, a little bit of sleep a little bit of good food, a little bit of reading, a little bit of listening, and uh, so you can find some way to help somebody any given day. And through those experiences, you develop opportunities to discuss things that you might not otherwise discuss. Why is this person in that situation? What did you feel when you helped them? You know, all these ideas, and it was, which was uh, what I was doing to advance black belts. Well, so how did it feel? to do these acts of kindness. Was it easy? Was it hard? Now you have the experience to talk to others about it because you've lived it. Uh, there's that famous Gandhi story about the candy. A woman comes up to Gandhi and says, you know, my son's eating too much candy. Can you have a talk with him about it? He says, yeah, bring him back, you know, next week when you come. And so she brings him back the next week. Gandhi gives him a big lecture about candy and the kid goes off and uh, the mom comes up and says, that didn't take very long. Why didn't you do that last week? And Gandhi has proposed to have said, well, I had to quit eating candy first. <laughs> <You know? laughs> when you go through something, you know, you can mm -hmm. come to it from a whole different place. So parents being involved in the community, even if this much teaches by example for kids. And I, I consider that today, especially one of the most potent forms of self-defense, connection to others, mm -hmm. compassion, participation, engagement. Well, I've said for a long time in a very jockey, big kind of martial arty kind of way that one of my favorite things that ways of self-defense right now at my point in my own martial arts journey is I'm friends with everybody who can whip my butt. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and although, you know, that, that's humorous and it's a little macho, a little uh, toxic masculine these days, it's that idea of knowing your neighbors, both from the standpoint of there's people who can help you if there's trouble, to also, if you know your neighbors, you know when there's a van on the street or a person on the street who doesn't belong. And you don't want to be, you know, overly judgmental or escalate things too quickly, but just know that that's a thing to keep an eye on. That's one way that you can keep a kid safe, teach your kids to keep themselves safe with exactly the kind of things you're suggesting here. Yeah, you know, there's... Uh, something to be said about fear mm -hmm. uh, uh but i don't think we should mm -hmm. you're not at your best when you're afraid yeah you know so but being aware of mm -hmm. what happens and there's plenty of statistics out there about you know things that cause pain and suffering mm -hmm. be they attitudinal or mm -hmm. physical or dietary and so just getting an education mm -hmm. and then figuring out a way to break it down into small daily increments mm -hmm. you know maybe talk about the food you're making or mm -hmm. what you're avoiding uh, i had a program called six tasks where instructors would send the child out from the dojo with some tasks you know like you went to the mountain you got told what to do you went out and did it you came back you reported and one of them was uh, for self-discipline was you, the kids kept a list of foods they avoided. <laughs> they had to self -defense. They didn't eat that second piece of cake. They didn't eat that lollipop, you know, and the, it gave an opportunity for the instructor and parent mm -hmm. to say, wow, you know, and have some dialogue about it and give praise where it's due. But mm -hmm. so uh, sometimes it's what you're avoiding and not what you're mm -hmm you're pursuing, you know, the moving away from versus moving towards. Well, the use of negative space, yeah, which is a good way to bring up. I, I always give each of my, my guests an opportunity to talk about what they're doing now, what kind of projects they're involved in. And you've kind of shifted from traditional martial arts, physical martial arts to just art recently. And some of your work's been amazing. You did the cover for one of my books. Um, so could you uh, tell the viewers a little bit about what you're up to and where they might be able to find a Tom Callis original? 
Well, you can find my stuff at TomCallis.com. This commercial was brought to you by TomCallis.com. Uh, yeah, I've made art uh, because I've had a lifelong interest. Uh, one day I walked in, in my 20s, walked into a store, and there was a big uh, uh, print of uh, Raoul Buffy painting, a French fall painter. And I just, it woke me up. I just said, well, who did that? And then that started me on an exploration of who was who and what they were making and what I liked and what didn't like. But it took me uh, to a point where my kids had grown up and moved out that I was able to sit down and, and carve out the time to start trying to make things. And what I like about trying to make things, one is I couldn't afford the art that I wanted to buy. So I said, well, I'm going to make some. And then the, uh, and it's much cheaper to make it, but not a lot. <laughs> you still spend a lot of money on supplies. And, uh, but it, I've it, had that exact experience with my bookcases. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? So, but it's looking, it's about looking deeply. And uh, I heard somebody say one time that, uh, that an expert is someone who makes more distinctions. So for me, a, the camshaft of a Corvair and the camshaft of a Corvette would look exactly the same as would a species of butterfly one from the other but an expert can make distinctions about those things and identify why they're different and and where they belong and so on and i think the same thing goes for art you know you start to have to look deeply at what colors and shapes and who's come before you and what you want to express and i just like that practice it's the same feeling i get when i'm involved in a match and I'm wrestling with someone, you're just looking for small things that make a difference because you're both often equally matched, but a foot put in the right part of the knee or a, you know, some leverage or a shift to the left or right, and all of a sudden the game changes, but you have to learn how to, to slow down, to relax, to think clearly, to be present, and the art requires those things, as does writing, and ideally parenting too, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I had all of a sudden realized that the title of your autobiography should be Wrestling with the Muse. I'm going to write that, that one down. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Outstanding. So uh, I'd like to wrap up, Tom, with just talking a bit about you've created a number of curriculums for martial arts instruction, for instruction for martial arts teachers. If we were to sit together and spitball a curriculum for parents for self-defense and for family safety, what would be the most important elements that you, you would encourage parents to learn about to keep their kids safe? Well, I'd start with the top 10 killers. Mm -hmm. You can find it, you know, uh, there's some dietary things in there that we should be an ongoing discussion uh, for the health of the parent and for the health of those the parent cares for. I think little simple things like uh, uh, an escape route out of a home, setting it up, make sure your fire alarms are working, that you have uh, uh, canisters of fire retardant and all those things, little tiny things like that, that the kids can be involved in. I made up a game one time uh, because I, uh, I had a student who died in a, of smoke inhalation in a fire. And I had a dream after that, that uh, I lived in Reno at the time. And I remember there was neon on the floor and it, there were arrows pointing out and we were crawling out of the house. And I, when I woke up, I made some notes and I came up with the escape route safety card game where you put a bunch of red arrows from the kids, your child's bed out to the safe place outside, how, where to escape, how to get out you know, how to crawl. And then we would run, we had a race card. So you could run a race against your dad. How long did it take dad to do the roll out of the bed, crawl, put your hand on the, the door, yell fire, open it, crawl out, get to the safe place. You know, it might be 45 mm -hmm. seconds, but it gave the child some way to have an experience, a heightened experience where they could learn that. And that game actually saved a couple kids lives in San Francisco. I had an instructor mm -hmm. there who was teaching that program and he got a call later from someone who said our house caught fire and these our kids escaped just as we had rehearsed and that you can live a whole lifetime for that kind of you know mm. that you saved one life much less mm. two and then uh, so I had another game where you could go around the house and 
you'd say you had 10 cards and they were numbered one through 10 and you would put them in places that you thought were maybe dangerous, like by the stove. So they don't pull down a pot on them or by the heater van or by any electrical outlet. And you could go with children of a certain age and say, okay, you, it's a hide and seek game. I put out the cards, you go find them. So kid runs out of the bedroom and finds the first one at the stove and he said, I got one. And you say, well, why is this possibly dangerous? Well, yeah. and then they explain it to you because you've taught them how to talk about it. Then you go find the next one until you let the child then go do the hide and seek. So you go in the bedroom, the child goes out and places the cards wherever they think might be dangerous. And then you play the game in reverse and come out and find them. And they explain to you, Ooh. Why did you do that? Well, you know, mom, that the f that can get really hot. And if you pull it down, you could burn, you know, boom. Mm -hmm. But games for young children to get them to have experiences, to be, to create an opportunity for them to remember something because it's, mm -hmm. the lights are turned on and it's a party. And uh, Yeah, I don't remember the exact numbers, but some research came out recently about how much faster we retain, we learn and retain information when it's introduced during play as opposed to during, to during study or a lecture. But the number is something like three or five times as quickly, and we retain it for an order of magnitude longer. So that's, that's amazing. You're way ahead of your time there, Coach. Well, I think that uh, every parent watching this has a sense of <clears throat> what they'd like their children to know. And so if we were developing a curriculum for a martial arts school, I'd say, well, what do we want the outcome to be? We want people who know how to be gentlemen and gentle ladies, right? So they have a certain sense of composure and they know how to introduce people and they can give a polite greeting, they can make eye contact, little things like that. And then you work your way backwards, you know, what do I want the outcome to be? And so let's just count how many times we're practicing these things, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe we can work them in. So I had in every class, we had a polite greeting, we had a polite departure. We just work those things into the, to what we did on a daily basis. And parents, as you know, you have a long laundry list, including laundry that you have to do every day that you, you know, are compulsory parenting things, you know, make the bed, clean the toilet, feed the kids. And if you could uh, just remember that uh, to mark out time and make it a habitual practice to deal with issues of self-defense, be a esoteric or specific, you know, like how, let's work on that block and the punch that you learned in class the other day. Uh, it, it would accumulate over, you know, uh, 10 minutes a day is, uh, I don't think it was 146 or 156 hours in a year. And so if you've spent a hundred hours coaching your children about attitude purposely, intentionally, not by accident or by calamity, but you have a practice of saying, this is our time when we sit down and talk. And we talk about ideas and experiences and parents do it already. But a lot of us get, you know, you start getting really busy and you go, yeah, I haven't talked about that forever. In self-defense training, anything you can say before an event occurs, before the fire, before the assault, before the, the bullying is better than 10 times better than anything you're going to be able to say after a an incident. Uh, everybody gets riled up and uh, motivated to action when something bad happens. Everybody jumps in. We should have done this. We could have done that. We'll implement this. Self-defense, the job of the self-defense teacher, be they a martial artist or a parent, is to anticipate what those things might be and deal with it in advance. It's a little too late when you've been beat up by the bully to say, well, let me show you what you should have done. When we can anticipate children will face bullies and we could rehearse those scenes and give them maybe some more tools in their toolbox. Uh, those are the kind of things that you can have, make into habitual practices that you do just incrementally a little bit most days. And uh, that's what more can you do as a parent? You can't be there. I cannot be there for every child that I ever taught that's gonna be bullied, fly up in my cape and inter intercede. You know? <laughs> But I can, my job is to say, you know, these things could happen. They're part of the world. So here's what you do about them in advance. And other than that, I don't know how to be any better of a teacher of self-defense. Well, that makes really good sense, the preparation. I feel like one of the superpowers that we get as martial artists is 
we spend a great deal more time thinking about what we would do on the worst day of our lives than most other folks. Maybe, you know, yeah. I think mm. the real benefit of self-defense is mm. just uh, taking something that you want to be good mm. at and learning how to break it into small mm. incremental practices. Mm. That's the, that's the mm. essence of what I learned from training in the martial arts, not how to protect myself, mm. not how to break things, not how to do all these ancient movements that we were, that were mm. passed to us, but just how to take anything, be it art or writing or friendship and and think about the things that can go wrong and be preemptive you know do things in advance you want a strong friend you act like a friend in advance you don't wait you know and uh, if you want to be healthy you can there's three to five meals a day or snacks that you can break down let's i can't think about eating a thousand healthy meals but i can do the next meal i can avoid too much of this or not enough of that you know and as parents, that, that directly applies to you know, raising a child as a matter of small incremental things every day. And whether we do those accidentally or whether we do those on purpose with a plan to raise healthy, safe kids who can go on to be healthy, safe adults. It's going like to the place. mission. It's going to be accidental. Mm -hmm. It's going to be purpose. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think anybody, you know, I, I don't think anybody watching this is going, mm -hmm. oh, wow. I've never heard these ideas before. You know, I think it's just a matter mm -hmm. of uh, reminding. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's kind of what it is to sit down at the desk and start to make something every day is you have to go back to the basics. And they're often very, very mm -hmm. simple. An idea, a sketch, the right tools, some paper, mm -hmm. some canvas, whatever it is. And uh, that's why listening to podcasts like this takes a few minutes, but you come out going, oh yeah, you know, I, it was like when I was in school in psychology, I remember one of the teachers, it's a well-known lesson. He looks around the room and says, okay, count everything red. And you'd look around, count everything red. And he'd say, how many green things did you see? You know, <laughs> you weren't looking for the green. You, you know, you have to, mm -hmm. sometimes the mental cues of hearing somebody talk about things you already know brings you back to your center and you proceed with that reminder. It's, it's learning how to get your feet on the mat every day. Because the dojo is there, and you know, but getting there is, can be tough. So if you get there on the mat every day, and whether you have a good training that day or not, whether you hit the marks and so on, but just showing up mm -hmm. and parenting is like that. You know, having some lesson is you're not going to be successful in any remarkably successful in any given lesson. Probably you're not going to go from white belt to black belt in a week, or you know, in a Bruce Lee movie but you're going to uh, work on it, chip away, and just three acts a day of, of enlightened parenting, you know, of, of mm -hmm. mission-based dialogue with your children or experiential opportunities that you create mm -hmm. uh, in a year add up to a thousand. And you start doing something a thousand times, oftentimes you start to make enough mistakes to get good at whatever it is that, that you're pursuing. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's that's a great sentiment to end on, Coach. That I, I remember participating in your thousand acts of kindness and how that impacted me and how that impacted my kids at the time. And just the idea of a thousand acts of mindful, engaged, purposeful parenting is so that's gonna be my takeaway for this conversation. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, even having a journal for kids mm -hmm. where they say, Who have I helped lately? Mm -hmm. You know, and having them, well, I helped, you know, and you start, you get what you focus on, such as red and green. And mm -hmm. so creating uh, this experiential out of your house and in the world kind of experiences mm -hmm. and, and then mining them for the lessons that they deliver, but mm -hmm. and purposely not through not being distracted by your phone or mm -hmm. your responsibilities, but mindfully going after these experiences that you know, or you hope that they'll retain mm -hmm. as they get older. You, know, you never know what kids are going to retain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that does remind me of uh, when my littlest one was two and a half, I was doing a big remodel in the house. And two days afterwards, I saw him in the corner with his little plastic tool set, whacking on something, turning the thing, and swearing like a sailor. Because <laughs> he, he observed very carefully and learned the lesson very quickly. Yeah, he'll remember that, but he won't yeah. remember, you know, the 400 other lessons you hoped to, that he would have yeah. embraced. But... 
anyway, it's funny. Thank yeah. you for letting me be a yeah. part of the dialogue. And I mm. hope that if those of you who are listening maybe pulled something out of it that mm. you can carry with you to make you feel a little more empowered and, and mm. directed. Well, thank you, Tom, so much for being a part of this. You've always been a supporter of my projects. And thank you for being a part of this one, too. Well, you're doing the kind of martial arts work through this podcast that I think is the work of like master teachers, people who have transcended the subject matter and broadened the scope of dialogue to include ideas that maybe don't take place on the mat, but are just important as important as self-defense. And that's what you're doing with this series. So thank you again. And I look forward to seeing your other guests. Thank you for watching our show today. I hope you found something useful. If you have any questions about what you saw, please do leave them in the comments below. Myself, our guest, or our community will do our best to get those answers for you. If we don't know them ourselves, we will go find someone who knows them. If you loved us, please do hit the like button and the subscribe button. They make a bigger difference than you're thinking right now. And of course, go ahead and click on some of those videos YouTube is suggesting to you right now. We have a lot of stuff that we've worked hard on and are proud of and hope that you'll enjoy them too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.